Today I thought I would expand on some ideas that I've covered in other videos about replacing the capacitors and other key components that surround operational amplifiers in the record and playback circuits of cassette recorders. The context for this, this is a, a real scenario if you like, I'm in the middle of fixing something. You may have seen some other videos I made about the 488, I was having trouble getting proper tape contact between the cassette and the head and it turns out the whole thing was dumb, it was just because like I had a missing screw inside the cavity. So having dealt with that problem, I've now got the issue that tracks 1 through 7, I can get it so if I record a signal at say minus three decibels then it will play back at pretty close to minus three decibels so it's well calibrated. Track eight I've maxed out the trim pot and the playback still looks a little bit quiet and I've maxed out the trim pot for the level of the record amplifier and despite that it's a lot quieter. Now I can work around this by, for instance, if I want something to be play back at zero decibels, if I record to tape it upwards of plus six decibels, then it'll play back about zero decibels. So there's about six or seven dB gap between where it should be and where it is. So it's not unworkable, but what I'm rather suspicious of is if it's already having those kind of problems, is it gonna stay fixed or is it gonna get worse? So my usual suspect in situations like this is electrolytic capacitors. We've got this very common situation where here's an operational amplifier, the signal's traveling from the right hand side of the screen to the left and either side of the operational amplifier there's an electrolytic capacitor. And it's my experience because these are little barrels containing liquid and gel, because they're polarized and effectively they see the alternating current of uh, an audio signal passing through them as a sort of friction and because they generally are expected to have a shelf life of around 20 years and most Porter Studios are at least 20 years old, 40 years old in some instances. These are components that are not always the cause of it, but they often are. And I find if I replace those capacitors like these, often that fixes my problem. What else have I got highlighted here? Well, this point here, that's pins one and nine of this operational amplifier, that's the power input. Obviously, if the operational amplifier was getting no power, then uh, that would be bad. It wouldn't pass signal. I don't think that can be the case because I am getting a signal, just a weak one. I've also highlighted these two trim pots because if either of them were off value, you see they're meant to have a 47k range, then that could account for a quiet signal. So in the case of those, what I'll be doing is desoldering them, testing their maximum resistance out of circuit, and then uh, it providing they're okay putting them back in. So that's the record amplifier. I mean, in Photoshop, by the way, um, so I've added color coding to the schematic. The schematic is up on my blog. And, um, you know, typically I use red for positive voltage, blue for negative voltage, green for the audio path, and I highlight the components that I want to uh, measure or replace in pink. Then I can use them to make a list of the things that I'm looking for in the physical printer circuit board. Okay, and so here it's just in the upper left hand corner of the same schematic. I've got a similar thing here. There's no electrolytic capacitor between these two op amps, but there's one before it in the signal path and one after it in the signal path. Then it goes through this low pass filter and through this trim pot. Also on this one, you notice here's a positive power rail and there's an electrolytic capacitor there and here's the uh, negative input going down to ground on the, this operational amplifier. That's got an electrolytic capacitor on it. And then on the second one, the negative power rail has got an electrolytic capacitor on it. So those are other things that could, if they were leaky or off value, I suppose it would mean that maybe there's AC going into the uh, DC input of the uh, op amps and that would affect their behavior. I assume that they aren't preventing the signal from traveling altogether or the operational amplifiers wouldn't work at all. But again, they're on my hit list of components that I'm going to replace. So I'm going to replace one, two, three, four, five capacitors. I will also ensure that this trim pot and this trump trim pot are at the values that they should be. You know, that's 4.7 kilo ohms and 6.6 .6 kilo ohms respectively. And um, we can see the signals passing through this low pass filter chip. So I just want to make sure that the AC voltage that I have at the input and the output are roughly the same so that I know that this isn't responsible for attenuating the signal too much. If it is, then I would replace that as well. And again, the way I've got all this stuff organized in uh, Photoshop, you know, it's in folders. I can turn on and off. In fact, I'll try and show you that just now. Um, I, I can turn off all of those as a group. I can turn off individual bits of color. 
one layer at a time and that just helps me to get organized because if I just put down the phone again and, and zoom out we can see that there's actually an awful lot of information on one you know double page of A4 effectively reproduction amplifiers here record amplifiers here there's bias somewhere else that's the DBX up there there's all sorts of going on here so I mean the comparison I would give it's like having like the tube map and the bus routes and the location of the electricity pylons and all the drainage in a large area of London all on one diagram so um, I find this form of colour coding very helpful in uh, digesting what I'm seeing I'm through in the workshop now and you can see that I've made a list based on what we were looking at in the schematic. So 488 Mark 1 I've said to myself, reproduction amplifier, I want to change these capacitors and I've given the, I forget what the name for this is, but the reference number and this is the value in microfarads followed by the value in voltage. So that's 10 microfarads and 25 volts, C102 is 100 microfarads and 10 volts, etc. And then I've said that I want to check U103, so that was the low pass filter. Check R1110, that's one of the trim pots, and I want to check that the maximum value is still 4.7k, and check R113, which is 6.6k. And then I've made similar notes to myself for the record amplifier, so I'm changing two capacitors only in that case, and checking two trim pots. The next thing for me to do is to get this 488 open. I'm going to remove the record playback board, which is the leftmost one in the bottom half of the unit. Then I'm going to take my Sharpie, and I'm going to find these capacitors and these other parts and I'm going to mark them with a red sharpie. I can then proceed to, in the case of the capacitors, I'm going to change them one by one. I don't like to change more than one at a time because there's a lot more scope to put the wrong value in the wrong hole. So say I take out C1110, 1025, and uh, then I'll find, here's my kit of, I use Nichicon UFW. So I don't have, seem to have 10 microfarad 25 volt ones, I'll use 50 volt ones, That that's fine. You can go to a higher voltage, that's not an issue. 16 volt would be too low, um, they might overheat in that application, that kind of thing. And so I'll just go methodically through all that, you know, I'll have Netflix on in the background so I can do it sort of sa somewhat absent-mindedly. The resistors, I'll desolder them and check them out of circuit to make sure that they still have these maximum values. Might not do that for the EQ one actually, because I, I don't want to have to fiddle about with the recalibrating that but I'm, I'm definitely comfortable to do that with whichever one of these resistors is the trim pot you know the level controls for these parts of the circuit with the u103 i guess once i've reassembled it and i've got power in it um, i'll try and find a way to run a signal through that and i'll use my multimeter to test the ac value going into and coming out of that chip just to ensure that that isn't an issue which is attenuating the signal and at that point I'll reassemble and, you know, hopefully that mitigates my issue. With more troubleshooting, could I get a, a, a more detailed handle on what's happening here? Yes. But since that uh, troubleshooting would uh, be followed by me basically going in, removing boards and replacing capacitors, since I consider it to be good due diligence because of the shelf life of capacitors to simply replace them. A lot of the time for me, it's less stress. You know, I can be a bit more absent-minded and like catch up on some telly while I'm working. And it's not much more cost. I mean, what are we talking about? One, two, three, four, five, uh, six, seven. Seven capacitors, uh, 30 pence each. So talking about spending two pounds worth of capacitors on uh, doing this. Uh, th th to me, that's a no brainer. You know, I'd rather spend less time and less stress and a bit more in parts that make the uh, longevity of the unit better anyway. And my strike rate for approaching these problems in this way is pretty high. I would say a good 80% of the time when I approach this kind of problem in this fashion, it does work. The board is now out of the unit and I've started highlighting some of these capacitors using my red Sharpie. So, you know, here's ones I've highlighted. They've got red tips now, so I can find them easily. These ones with silver tips I'm not interested in. Now, how did I identify the capacitors for channel eight? considering that the numbers I wrote down were for channel one. And just to put that in context, what uh, task I'm tend to do in their schematics is that they will show you a detailed diagram of one channel. Um, so they show channel one for the playback amplifier, and then you're assumed to sort of understand the pattern for the other seven. They, give, they only give you an abbreviated answer about what the parts numbers are. But like, for instance, if you look here, like this part is 
you know, we've got R410 for channel four, but we've got R810 for channel eight. So usually there's one digit different. So initially I actually highlighted the parts that were on my list. These are the five capacitors that pertain to the playback amplifier for channel one. But there are these repeating constellations like the layout here for these parts for what's this channel five. It's very similar to the one for channel one and ditto up here in channel eight is very similar. So I, I can safely assume that these are the five capacitors that I want. And likewise, first of all, I found the capacitors for record amp one, but then now that I've identified those, I can get rid of the red using like a little isopropyl wipe. So I know I'm not interested in these capacitors. That was just to help me recognize the pattern. Now the ones I want for the repo amp are here. These two here and these five here. So I'll just get on with replacing those. Um, if you're not sure how I go about soldering, look for a video I did on the Porter 03. Um, I show my kind of protocol and approach to soldering in quite a lot of detail in that video. I'll put a link to it down in the description of this one. Just to elaborate on my process a little bit better, you can see where on the rear side of this, I use Sharpie to mark the position of the capacitors so I know what I'm desoldering. So at the moment, I've just removed this one. I'm going to find the equivalent value. And my supplies here, solder that in. Then I'll move to this one, then to this one, to this one, and so on. And here I am back in testing mode. Got my audio pro going into channel 8 and recording to channel 8. Uh, units propped open with a bit of cardboard. I've got blank tape in there. And the recap, which you can see here, you can see that I've mostly used uh, Nichika and Gold UFW caps for the channel 8 preamp here as well, which is to do with the record amp. And uh, that's given me the result I want when I'm putting in minus 3 decibel signal like that. When I play it back, I'm getting a minus 3 decibel playing back and it sounds clear. So, yeah, that worked on this occasion. I hope you find that helpful. Thanks for watching. See you again soon. Thank <laughs> you.